Uh, hi, hello. Uh, I'm Arek, and uh, you probably know me from some of my other presentations and from working on Proton. Yeah. Uh, today I will be talking a little bit about the gaming APIs. Uh, so basically, uh, this talk is like marked as intermediate because it requires a little bit of awareness uh, of like what C is, uh, like basic programming, a little bit uh, knowledge on like that syscalls are a thing, that uh, that uh, stack is a thing. So if you are at that level, like. You that, that should be fine. So I'll basically dive into how Wine actually does what it does and uh, all the APIs that we have la layered on top of each other. So uh, there's a meme that Wine is not an emu emulator, which is kind of, you know, if you read the last sentence of this thing, so emulation refers to ability of a computer program in an electronic device to emulate or imitate another program or device. That's kind of emulation. That's kind of what Wine does. But, you know, world is not a clear cut thing. There is rarely any like clear dichotomy. Uh, so, you know, is a hot dog a sandwich? Is cereal a uh, uh, soup? Who knows? <laughs> if you have answers, please let me know. But like, Stuff is not a clear cut. So instead, I like to think about wine as a compatibility layer because it's much more fitting the definition and there's like no words in between. And yeah, so that's also summarizes it. With some libraries for the frame system, this will often be sufficient to run frame binaries on the host system. So that fits as well. Both of the definitions are from Wikipedia. So how does wine work, right? Uh, the thing is that it doesn't do like a full-blown emulation. It actually runs the Windows process on Linux. So you get a Linux process for a Windows process and you actually execute the code directly. So uh, wine, like you probably are aware of something called the dynamic linker loader on Linux. Uh, to give you some context, when you run a binary on Linux, usually that's ELF, and usually it links to a lot of shared objects.sos. And that binary is not executed directly by kernel, but instead requires an interpreter as well. And that interpreter is uh, ldlinux.so. Uh, and this is what interprets some of the sections of the binary, then uh, loads all the required SOs, maps them into memory, into some known addresses, uh, does some process setup and then jumps into uh, the entry routine of uh, of whatever binary you have been launching. So, um, and this interprets the ELF section, so it's not like interpreter in case of interpreted language. So, Wine is kind of like that, but for PE. And PE stands for uh, Portable Executable, which is ELF-like thing for Windows. So, that's their binary format. So, when you execute Wine foo.exe, a uh, few things happen. So Wine program by itself is very bare bones. It doesn't contain a lot of logic. The main thing it does is uh, it finds and loads ntdll.so. And uh, this is what contains uh, most of the stuff that happens later on. Uh, more, more on the distinction between SOs and DLLs a little bit later. So then uh, from that ntdll SO, we find Wine main. This is what actually like does all the heavy lifting. And then we have this weird chain where Wine exits into Wine 64 preloader and then goes back to Wine. So we have like a trampoline through Wine 64 preloader. The reason for that is that we need something written in assembly that doesn't load a lot of stuff so we can reserve address space. Because Windows is special in a way that there are huge chunks of memory address space that are reserved and have defined meaning. So you have to reserve them so the Unix uh, side of things, so the loader wasn't just put some crap in there that you don't want to, and then Windows side would be confused. So you reserve those address space and then go back to Wine, make, and you're sure that those memory ranges are mapped and not going to be used. It also needs the environment and uh, stacks. So for the environment, that's mostly setting up all the Windows systems uh, that are under known memory addresses or like in uh, segment registers. So we have PEB, which is process environment block. You can think about it as uh, like a state of your process. This is uh, this represents your process. This represents all the things uh, that's running and then it has like some global state for it that's, that's necessary. Tab is kind of the same, but for your thread. So it's also like a 
global state, but per thread one. Uh, so you have your thread local uh, storage in there. You have some information about like the execution environment, about the stacks. We also hijack some of the fields of those structures that are not used in line for anything in particular uh, to help us uh, implement uh, certain like hacks to go from a world of Linux executables to Windows and back. So. Uh, USD is user shared data, shared data. Uh, more on that a little bit later, but that's basically a page mapped in memory at constant address. And what it has is information from kernel. So it's read only, the kernel on Windows populates that and you have like a bunch of different information there. Like for example, the current key, uh, tick count. So you can just read the value from there and you roughly know the current time. Oops, I skipped a little bit too far. Uh, then you start Wine Server. Uh, what Wine Server does and what are uh, its responsibilities? A little bit more on that later. Then finally we get to load uh, that foo.exe, and we do the same thing as uh, the Linux loader. So we parse the PE headers. We see what DLLs should be loaded. We load the imports. Uh, do the relocations of addresses if you mapped it at the different thing uh, than the base address, and then we load anti DLL. So here was the anti DLL SO. So that's the uh, Linux part of NTDLL, but we also need the Windows part because all the processes on Windows kind of expect those functions to be available. And then we do the jump into the Windows code. So there's like a, this whole chain that you might find interesting a little bit later. Uh, but basically then we start executing Windows code. So at this point, when we call the entry point, you are in the Windows world and on the Windows stack. So here in init environment, I mentioned that we need initialize stacks because it, it's kind of like with kernel on Linux, you have two stacks. One is on the kernel side, one is on the uh, user space side. So here you have one stack that's on the Linux side of things, whenever you're executing something on the Linux things uh, from your given thread, and the other one is meant for Windows. So at this point entry, uh, you are having a single process of a single thread that has uh, the Windows stack switched on and that starts executing the PE code. But the question is, now we are executing Windows code, so how we actually go back to Unix to do something useful, right? Because we don't speak Windows. Like, Linux doesn't understand like how to execute Windows syscalls. It doesn't uh, understand like how to do all of that stuff. So we have to go back to Unix to do things. And the answer for that is syscalls. So luckily for us, uh, on Windows, uh, syscalls are done very differently than what we do on Linux. So on Linux, you have this contract where a uh, syscall number is set in stone, and it's basically a guarantee ABI of the Linux kernel. On Windows, that's not the case. Like the numbers can change at any time, uh, but they have a contract in terms of anti functions. So anti DLL, so and a couple of other uh, DLL, sorry, the DLL version on Windows has a bunch of functions that start with NT. Uh, for example, like NT delay execution, this is what you do when you want to sleep for a while. NT set an event, so this is when you want to flag an event uh, synchronization primitive, or when you want to write a file. So those functions do the syscalls for you, and this is what you should use. Because if you try to call a syscall directly, you may end up calling something else because you updated Windows. So that helps us a lot because we don't have to intercept calls on the sysenter level or like the int uh, 80 hexadecimal uh, level and do crazy stuff there. It's just we have to hijack those functions, right? So how does the calling into the Unix side actually work? So this is a func, so like a wrapper function that just is responsible for calling something else. Uh, the, on example of anti-close, which tries to issue a syscall number 15, like 015 hexadecimal, because that's, that's not a 15. Uh, and it looks this way because some applications actually pick at that stuff. So it looks as close as we can to Windows, but the generally you can ignore the whole if statement because it's like if something looks uh, into that code and tries to interpret it and says, oh yeah, syscall OX15. Uh, then it feels like confident that like, yeah, it looks Windows like we can continue. But what actually happens, we uh, we call win, uh, wine syscall dispatcher. So this is just a normal function call. There's no syscalls happening. The syscall uh, 
this is called assembly instruction never gets invoked. So to mimic that also we use the user shared data. So that's an, uh, the page that I mentioned before that's shared by kernel at known offset. And it has one field that just marks you whether you have altered or unaltered view on the syscalls. Doesn't really matter what it does in Windows, we just use it for, for that purpose. And then we call this function pointer, which is also at a new address. On mine, we just put it just after the uh, user shared data page. So user shared data page, then you have the pointer to uh, syscall dispatcher. And then you just call that syscall dispatcher and it still, you know, still happens all in the user space, no syscalls were issued programs thing they did uh, a syscall because they called anti-close. Uh, if something is a little bit pesky, like anti-cheats or uh, Chromium, for example, likes to look at that stuff, uh, they they just see like, yeah, oh yeah, that they were going to try to do a syscall. Uh, there's a little bit of explanation like what those addresses mean here. Uh, and then we have this wine syscall dispatcher. So this is the function that we uh, fetch the pointer to and we have called. So what it does, it does the, the same thing like syscall would do. Uh, that means uh, we have to store the current context because we remember we are in the on the Windows side of things, right? So we are executing Windows expecting code and we have Windows stack on. So we have to uh, pre preserve the environment that we are currently executing, register values and so on, because it's a function call. And then we store that in syscall frame. Uh, we just use some fields in tab. So because syscalls are per thread, uh, so we have to store that data somewhere. And luckily there's GDT tab batch uh, field that's not used for anyone anything else in line. So we can just reuse that uh, for storing the context. Uh, then we switch the thread stacks from the user space, so the Windows one, to the kernel one. So as I've said, we allocate two, uh, two stacks per thread. And now we have a fresh stack that we can st start all our Unix calls. Uh, we also put some stuff on the stack, uh, like the return addresses. So the function can just normally uh, return. Also, we have to figure out what call we have to uh, execute. Because as you see here, we just execute that with a number, right? So this is call number is 15 hexadecimal. Uh, and we have to figure out what that translates to. So there is something called system service descriptor table, which is also a case on Windows. And we just use that to store uh, pointers to functions on the Linux side. And then we just call that uh, Unix function and you have normal like a Linux environment. You can use normal Linux coder. You can do syscalls from that point on. Uh, you can write files, open files, do whatever you want. Uh, after you are done, you return from uh, that Unix function. Then you get back to the dispatcher. The dispatcher restores the context, restores the Windows stack and returns to the system uh, call thanks to your back in the Windows world. So basically you operate in the Windows world unless you switch back to Linux. And this, this is like how it operates now, starting with Wine 7.0 and 9.0, like all libraries were converted to use this method. Historically, we were doing things a little bit differently, but that doesn't really matter now. Uh, so I, as I mentioned, there's some software that la la likes to peek at all of that. So they uh, try to do real syscalls. So if you are Chromium, then you quite likely look at the uh, syscall number. So if we go back here, you can see like the, the first, the second instruction is basically move the number of the syscall into the EAX register. So Chromium likes to look at that and then just invoke the syscalls directly for whatever reason. Uh, there's also some games like Rockstar games like to hard code the numbers given uh, like from extracted from some version of Windows. So the hard part is what do we do now? Because they actually try to do syscalls and that number doesn't mean the same thing on Windows. Uh, luckily, now we have a mechanism that's called uh, seccomv BPF and you can write a simple BPF program that kernel executes whenever you try to do a syscall. And depending on the result, it does different things. So we install a program that says like, yeah, if it comes from the PE range, please don't execute that syscall at all. Instead, let us know that this happened. So this is used for some sandboxing. This is used for like uh, preventing certain syscalls uh, to happen, but we basically prevent all syscalls from the PE address range. And whenever that happens, whenever something tries to call it, we get a sixes. Uh, so we have, uh, this is just a normal Unix uh, signal and we just get that and the, our handler 
then it's responsible, uh, like it has some assembly logic that ends up calling into the dispatcher that we've seen before, uh, and we handle everything in user space. So this this thing, this way we convince the uh, P side that yeah your syscall actually has succeeded and uh, we have managed to do that. Luckily, you know a lot of stuff do, does that because it's kind of slow because it has to execute uh, into the kernel mode. So you have the mode switch, then you have to go back to the user space and you have to dispatch the signal and then uh, like finish the signal handling. It's kind of slow, but it, it's not used for everything. It's most like anti cheaty stuff. Uh, but not everything is syscalls, right? So uh, theoretically, you can implement everything as IO controls on top of devices, but that's a little bit annoying and there are probably some things that you want to optimize a little bit. Uh, and you don't want to introduce like IOCTLs uh, per Vulkan call or anything like that. So instead, we have a faster dispatcher uh, for things that are not really mapped onto syscalls. So let's say you're a Vulkan driver and you want to call uh, the corresponding function on the Linux side. So this is what you would use. Uh, and uh, this is where also the distinction between uh, between SO and DLL comes into place. So uh, whenever you uh, load one of those fine DLLs that have the corresponding SO part, the loader is smart enough to understand that and then it loads the SO along with the DLL. So you load both into the memory at the same time. And then the DLL has a table of the syscalls accessible via, via entity query virtual memory, which is a syscall uh, with magic memory. Uh, so with magic flag, we call it memory wine Unix funks. What it does is uh, like undefined on Windows because it's out of the range of the flags normally defined there. It's a special thing for wine. And we just get an address in the uh, Linux uh, address space of a function point. Uh, of a table that has function pointers. This is one of the symbols that's exposed by the SO. So basically that's get loaded and we get pointer to it so we can call into it. But we cannot call into it directly because that would be a little bit confusing. We have still the Windows stack on and you have different calling conventions. So instead we have something called wine Unix call, which is stripped down an optimized version of the syscall dispatcher. So instead of uh, giving it a number and uh, it having to do a lot of uh, uh, context preservation and then having to go uh, look what that number means, you just give it the function pointer from the from the table and then uh, arguments and you just call it. So it calls it directly. So it's much more optimal version of the syscall. Syscalls are a little bit slower. And also uh, since it's not considered a syscall by Windows, there's a different calling convention. So you don't have to preserve as much of the context. So fewer, uh, fewer moves. So if you want like, so I know this is a lot, uh, all of that. Uh, I have a blog post, uh, two blog posts about how that works in much more detail. Uh, so you can ingest that at your own pace, at your own leisure. Uh, it also links to all the relevant code uh, in Wine. So if you want to figure out how this actually works and see the assembly that does all those things, this is the way to go. So just look me up and you will be able to find that. But that gives you basic uh, understanding. So we have the P side, that's what's executing by default. And then we have certain holes that you can like poke at and suddenly you end up on the Linux side doing things and then returning to the, Lin uh, to the Windows side of things. Uh, Wine server. So this is one of the things I've mentioned uh, that it's being started up on the execution of the, your first binary. So this is like a global thing per your uh, wine prefix. And wine prefix is like a Windows session. You can think about it like that. So it's uh, your own view of the file system and also like a one booted operating system. So wine server is kernel-like. By that, I mean it does a lot of the same bookkeeping that uh, the kernel does on Windows, but we need a uh, over uh, like a uh, hypervisor, but not, not happy hypervisor in the term of visualization hypervisor, but like something that does the same things uh, for Wine, uh, like keeping all the global things and uh, mediating all the communication between processes. So, uh, 
And this is exactly what it does. So whenever you spawn a new process uh, in wine, and that's a PE process, you have to also to uh, talk to the wine server to tell it, hey, there's a new process. Because the bookkeeping and the process hierarchy on Windows looks a little bit different than Linux. So you cannot get all the information that you need about the hierarchy, about the state of the processes, just using the Linux API. So you have to do that extra bookkeeping on top. And also you have to be able to query whatever the processes are running within your wine instance. So that within your prefix. So it does that for processes and threads, and then you can query that information back. For example, hey, uh, you know, like PS on Linux, uh, give me information about all the processes running. So you'll get just the information about the Windows processes that are running. Uh, it also handles clipboards, access global uh, items. So this is when you want to register a string that's uh, globally accessible by uh, all the applications, uh, window tracking. So whenever you create a window, you know, we create an X11 window that's actually being displayed, but there's extra state that needs to be tracked and that's uh, done by the server. It does handle management. Handles are kind of like file descriptors, but on Windows. Uh, it also mediates all the registry access. So Windows has this uh, cursed thing called Windows Registry. And uh, Whenever you do a write of it or like read something from it, it goes to wine server, which mediates all the accesses and making sure that like the state is consistent. It also periodically dumps it onto the hard drive. I think we do that by default uh, every 30 seconds and up on the server shutdown. So whenever you are closing group prefix, whenever the last application was closed, uh, it shuts down and writes that. It also handles the shared memory, including the user shared data that I've mentioned before. So, now let's talk a little bit about what we actually do with all that stuff. So you've got the context on uh, how the process starts, how we cross back into the Linux world, and what Wine Server does. But then we have 40 DLLs, and I'm not going to cover all of them, I'm not that boring, uh, to uh, how, like, how we use those facilities, what do we actually do, and when we cross the border into the Linux world. So first thing is synchronization. Like that's very basic for, for everything. Like you need uh, your semaphores, you need your events, you need your mutexes. Uh, and there's a bunch of syscalls that are uh, in the anti namespace. So anti uh, events, so for example, set event or reset event, uh, the same thing with semaphores. And then you have a bunch of functions that allow you to wait, like anti wait for a single object or anti wait for all ob uh, many objects, multiple, multiple objects. Uh, those are syscalls, but we have actually four right now, four different underlying implementations of how syncing works in Linux, because uh, those two words are, worlds are not the same and Windows has primitives that you cannot really do in the user space. So the first sync, uh, syncing mechanism we did was uh, mediated by Wine Server. So whenever you were doing any kind of operation that requires synchronization, it was going through Wine Server. So you, you got a socket from Wine Server and then you talk to Wine Server, hey, I'm waiting, waiting on those events. Wine Server was doing some internal bookkeeping and then waking you up. But that's very slow because it requires inter process communication for each single operation. Uh, we have superseded that in Proton with something called eSync. So we, uh, Linux has this nice facility called EventFD. So those are file descriptors that have extra behavior that are not just a simple files, but allow you to uh, create events and react on events. And all of that is faster in user space. So uh, that means that you don't have to do that IPC through like it's not exactly fully in uh, user space. You still do syscalls, but that, that, that's details. Uh, but the problem with it is that it requires a lot of uh, file descriptors available. So one of the problems with it was that a lot of distributions have pretty low limits for how many file descriptors given users can have open or a given process can have opened. And... Uh, that caused troubles because when you run out of file descriptors, suddenly you cannot open new files and you cannot new, uh, create new uh, sync primitives. So that was superseded again by something called fsync, which uses few texts, which are quick uh, user space uh, synchronization primitives. 
uh, no dependency of number of open files, but similar limitations like uh, server was a little bit better at me making some of uh, the specifics of Windows scheduling and how those calls are handled, uh, but was slow. So we had something fast, but not exactly fully compliant. And the latest effort to fix that is actually to go to the Linux kernel and fix it there. So uh, to provide proper synchronization that has the same semantics as you have on Linux, oh sorry, on Windows, you have to write a kernel driver. And this is something called anti-sync. It's also known as fast sync or wind sync, depending like where you look. Uh, it's still work in progress. There was a proposal sent publicly to the mailing list, but nobody responded. Uh, so the kernel driver is just being uh, developed. And the benefit of that is like, we have all the power of the kernel in the driver. So that means we can accurately implement all the synchronization primitive that, uh, primitives that Windows has, but we haven't had on Linux uh, uh, to this day. Like they have really weird stuff. So we have like uh, ways of pulsing an event. You have something called smutants. It's, it's a wild word, uh, wild word. Uh, then we have audio. So Windows has a one low level audio API called MM device API. Uh, it allows you to enumerate all audio devices, create instances, uh, like get the buffers, write to those buffers, audio play. So it's like a very, very low level uh, thing that you have to deal with. And it has a bunch of backends on uh, Wine side. Uh, one of that is Wine Pulse. Um, so this is probably what most of you are using, whether you're using Pipewire or Pulse. It just does the same thing, like creates the same, uh, recreates the same API based on uh, Pulse Audio API. And we're just dealing with audio buffers, so there's not much to do. Uh, it's fairly straightforward, one of the more straightforward parts of Wine. We have also backends for Alsa. Uh, we have also uh, backends for OSS, so uh, I guess this is mostly for BSD folks nowadays, because I'm not sure if anyone else uses OSS. Uh, there's Wine Core Audio, so that's for OS X, uh, and that's bas basically it. Like you have just a few backends and then operating buffers. Uh, now we come to a little bit more complex world, 3D, because you have APIs like Vulkan which are very complex. You have a lot of calls, you have loader, you have enumerating devices, then you create that device instance, and the, then you have to, uh, like there's a lot of functions for each device. So instead of trying to write every single function ourselves and like do the mapping one by one, because the APIs look kind of the same, both on the Windows side and the Linux side, we can ju do automatic mapping for most of that stuff. So this is where make Vulkan uh, comes into play. It's just a script that parses VKXML, which is the XML uh, that's released with each Vulkan version that describes all the functions and the, basically the whole of API. And it generates uh, all the code for you. Um, then if something cannot be handled automatically, and there are some reasons like where there's small differences between operating systems or structure and requires manual conversion because it doesn't exactly map to the same thing, then we have uh, wrappers that are written by hand. And also some extensions require mapping. So Vulkan on Windows uses uh, VK create Win32 surface because you want to create a surface that's uh, native to Windows and that you can render onto, that you can draw things. Uh, but on Windows, on Linux, we don't have that. So we have to fake that uh, we support the extension that provides the Win32 surfaces, but we have to map that onto Xlib surfaces because X11. So basically most of the code is generated. We have like a few thousands of lines of code of customized stuff, which is not a lot for Vulkan. Uh, and it just works. Uh, we have something very similar for OpenGL. So OpenGL is similar on the both sides of uh, the world. So you have uh, the, the Windows version and the Linux version are basically the same, and we have to do the same thing. We have make OpenGL, which is written in Perl, historical reasons. Uh, it parses uh, the XMLs, uh, including the one with has some extra extensions, and um, the same thing for uh, like handwoven wrappers. Uh, let's see. Uh, now we come to graphics, and I mean like 2D graphics and displaying windows and basic uh, drawing operations, not 3D. 
So we have also multiple Unix backends that implement all those functions uh, that you have in Windows. So Wine X11 driver, this is probably what you're using right now uh, whenever you're using Wine. There is upcoming Wine Wayland that's merged upstream uh, but has limited functionality. There's also a historic driver for Wine Android. I'm not sure what state it is in currently and if anyone is actively using that. And there's also Wine Mag that uses the nice Cocoa API. Uh, so those functions are mostly uh, backing like anti-GDI uh, system calls. Uh, and those are quite often like also system calls. Uh, and you have like a bunch of calls for handling keyboard, for handling mouse. So everything you can think about graphics APIs and windowing. Uh, bitmap creation, a blitting, uh, reading the state of the Sorry for that. Uh, reading the state of the keyboard, uh, reading the state of the cursor, moving the cursor, uh, setting focus, creating windows, uh, and uh, changing display settings, like uh, setting a different mode, or uh, this is also where we do the platform-specific window system integration, where we do the mapping of the Vulkan functions. So this, all, all of those have to be re-implemented on top of whatever graphic API I want to support, whether that's Wayland, whether that's X11. Uh, Wine X11, this is mostly misery and pain, and I don't recommend you talk, uh, touching that because basically you have two very distinct windowing APIs. Uh, one of them, uh, like that evolved separately into different directions. They are both very low level and they've been, uh, yeah, so they've been just evolving over 40 years. And uh, there's also a very weird thing with Linux that we have fragmentation. You probably heard KDE, GNOME, uh, Sway, i3, and uh, the standards are not very rigid and you have a lot of freedom of what you can do. Uh, and this causes a little bit of disconnect and a little bit of weird behavior on just one or two few of window managers, whereas everything else it behaves correctly. And this is not their fault. Like, uh, the conjecture from the presentation that I'm mentioning here from XDC 2023 is that uh, windowing for general case, for example, when you are running uh, the normal desktop application that's written in a toolkit, whether that's GTK or Qt, is a solved problem because uh, there's specs for everything uh, they, that has been tested and tried and it just works, right? Uh, both the window manager developers and both the... Uh, Toolkit developers worked on that for years, and like basically there haven't been big movement when it comes to extending X11 in 10 plus years. Uh, but then you have this thing, which maps low-level API onto another low-level API with all those 40 years of differences. And suddenly you start hitting all those dark corners that nobody poked at. So there's a lot of weird behavior we see, but this is only because we do weird stuff because Windows does weird stuff. Uh, Wine G streamer. Uh, so probably if you played games on Wine, especially Proton in the early days, you are used to seeing test pattern video. So you don't uh, see whatever the cutscene the game was playing uh, was supposed to play, but instead you've set, uh, seen a test pattern. So this is part of the reason why, because Windows has this uh, huge API called Media Foundation Quartz, which is just enormous. And you can like create the coders, create whole pipelines. It's very GStreamer-like in a way. Uh, and implementing that took a long time and a lot of effort and it's still not perfect. And also codec codecs are patented, so you cannot just play everything. You can just bundle everything. So uh, it's a huge pain. Uh, what we are doing here is uh, we're just bundling, uh, like using the host GStreamer and we are re re-implementing Media Foundation on top of GStreamer so you can use the, whatever you have installed in terms of decoders and encoders on your OS. Uh, and this is for just like media playback. Uh, then you have all the APIs that uh, support controllers. So probably uh, like when you want to play games, you use one of those, at least for some of the non-FPS titles. Uh, and we have to support those in Wine as well. And we have to expose them in a way that's understandable uh, by the Windows users. So we have a few, uh, we have a driver so that you see the uh, extensions a little bit different. So this one, this one is .sys. So this is like a driver-like uh, module. 
uh, that gets loaded into another process. And basically it has multiple Unix backends that allow us to access uh, the controller devices. So we use SDL primarily for more of the th most of the things. So if you're running one of those, that's SDL. And SDL is super nice because it has huge controller database. It normalizes a lot of uh, stuff for us. So we don't have to care about the differences and, and meanings and like all small subtleties between the controllers. But there's also UDEF uh, backend that we use mostly for hydro access. So if you ever uh, had PlayStation 5 controller, DualSense Enhance, it's a little bit fancy. It doesn't expose like a normal normal controller device, even on Windows. It's just a normal HID uh, device, so human input uh, device. Uh, and uh, basically all the games have to know how to speak to it directly to support it. So there's not like a normal high level API that you can use. Most of the games from Sony just talk to the controller directly on this low level protocol. So we just map that directly to uh, to uh, to the same primitives on the Windows side. And the funny thing is, Bluetooth is broken on those controllers. Uh, and Linux works around those that brokenness. So the reports and uh, like the packets that they are sending your way are very, very broken. They are not uh, compliant with the standard. So the kernel driver fixes them. The problem is that that doesn't happen on Windows. So we have to bro break them again before sending them to the Windows side of applications because the Windows applications that use the controller and are used to it and understand the controller expect the broken behavior. So uh, this is the, the kind of like things we have to deal with. So we have to break your DualSense and the DualShock 4 controllers again for you because otherwise you wouldn't be able to play Windows games. Uh, the difference is that we expose everything as hit devices. So uh, everything uh, on the Windows side that we have found, uh, other than keyboard and mouse, because you have like those other windowing primitives to handle that, is a hit device. And we create a fake one, uh, descriptors and reports, even when the device on the Linux side is something like a joystick that we found through SDL. And there's also a special hidden device because X input is also weird. So we have to create a special device with special semantics just for X input consumptions. More on that a little bit later. So the same goes for networking. Uh, guess, yeah, still have time, so that's good. Uh, basically, we have a bunch of DLLs that call into the Unix uh, side of things, whether that's uh, via Wine server or whether that's uh, via uh the like other uh, stand glibc uh functions like get other and get host uh there's also bcrypt which we implement on top of gnu tls and we use the host gnu tls because we don't want to maintain our own copy so you can imagine easily that we can imp implement everything inside of the linux si uh, windows side of things so bcrypt dll wouldn't have to have so but that means we would need to start either implementing everything by by hand you don't want to do your own cryptography uh, or we would need to start bundling gnu tls uh, like the windows build you also don't want to maintain that because you would need to update it every single time. Whereas if you depend on the distro provided version, uh, you can just count on the distributions to update it. So that's why Bcrypt is implemented and has the Unix site to call into the Linux uh, version of GNU TLS. And that's basically it. So 40 APIs, uh, 40 DLLs, a bunch of APIs. Uh, and then you have the rest of wine, which is 643 DLLs in Proton. Uh, and all of those are implemented purely on the PE side. So there's no Linux side. There's nothing that they cross into. They call some of the other DLLs that you've seen before that do that, but most of those DLLs, you can drop them on Windows and they will work. So, so now you understand a little bit of scope that wine is, right? It's a huge project. It's re-implementing the whole operating system with all the DLLs. And this is a bunch of complexity. So we have all that crazy things that we do and where we have to like break the barrier between things. But this is just like, yeah, that just re-implementation of Windows and that you can use on Windows. Uh, so uh, from here, the base stuff that you want to do is to re-implement your C runtimes. On Linux, we have glibc. On Windows, you have MSV, CRT, and your city base. And they basically re-implement the C and C++ runtime libraries. So things like write functions or malloc, 
also all your uh, all your floating point operation and the STD namespace in C++. So I have cosinus and eta arctangent uh, two highlighted because if you are into maths, uh, we could use your help. Uh, the problem is that a lot of games depend on that or, uh, on those uh, floating point functions to calculate the state. And the problem with it is that you can approximate those functions by polynomials in infinite ways. And the problem uh, is that if you have different implementations that return different, slightly different values for different numbers, then suddenly your sta uh, state starts desyncing. So if you play an online game with someone on Windows running the native version of those libraries, and you play uh, on Linux using our implementation, uh, suddenly you start desyncing and you get kicked or like weird things happen in the game. And we hear that quite often. There's a very nice write-up on Codeweaver's blog written by Remy Brennan uh, that explains the problem. And we are getting pretty close. There's still like 70,000 values that are sli slightly different, like off by one bit. Uh, but we haven't solved that yet. And this is one of the biggest bookers uh, when it comes to some of the online uh, online titles. So if you know maths and you're not, not interested in any of the other things, this is something definitely you can help with. And yes, please help us. Uh, audio. So uh, we've covered only the low-level API so far, but there are multiple high-level APIs on Windows that you can expect, like X-Audio. So we use the F-Audio projects that's part of FNA uh, to implement that. This is like the Xbox audio. Uh, there's D sound, so this is part of Direct X. So that's Direct Sound part of it. It's also implemented uh, purely on the PE side, so you can just drop those on Windows. And also interesting things, you can take those, drop those into the games on the Windows side, and then you can play with Linux users. Uh, controllers, the same thing, uh, purely implemented on the PE side. The input, so it basically uh, uses all the hit devices, then exposes normal devices. You can just uh, take it and drop it on Windows and it should work. Uh, there's nothing special about X input. It's a little bit special because there's this contract with uh, our backend that there is this special hidden hit device that exposes the weirdness of X input devices. So it, this one won't work on Windows. But Window Gaming Input, uh, so this is the new API that's used by Universal Windows Platform, built on top of the input and hit. Also should work on Windows. Wine D3D, uh, something you probably have heard about. So that's the implementation of DirectX starting from 1 to 11, uh, built on top of OpenGL and Vulkan. So you can use uh, OpenGL uh, 10, 11 games and run the Vulkan backend and it works, I think, even better than OpenGL right now. Uh, but it's still not disabled, uh, not enabled as default because there is still a little bit of work required for DirectX 9. Uh, tried and tested, and people are using it on Windows. Like if you Google like Wine D3D Windows, you will find a bunch of pre-compiled DLLs that you can drop into your game and they provide better compatibility with some older titles than what Microsoft does in their modern operating systems. So if you want to play some ancient game on Windows 11, that's probably your best bet. Uh, this is something we use in Proton. So it's implementation of DirectX 9 and 11 over Vulkan. Uh, that was uh, independent. Uh, that's an independent project from Wine, but we ship it in Proton. Uh, since the very beginning of the project. Also, just a PE runs on Windows, people do use it. I don't think it's encouraged or like really supported, but it works. Uh, so please don't bother the maintainers with questions about running that stuff on Windows. It does, but uh, there's also the XVK native. So this is a spin-off of this project that runs purely on the Linux side of things. So if you want ever wanted to write direct X code and run it on Linux without Wine, you can do that now. And this is how CSGO 2 ships and some other games as well. Uh, Viki D3D Proton, this is the same, originally forked from Wine. Uh, Wine's project, uh, uh, tight integration with DXVK, uh, solid DirectX 12 implementation that's uh, running all the modern AAA games. And as you've seen, all those things should work on Windows just fine because they're just implemented on top of other APIs. And the same thing uh, is with Wine. We implement those lower level APIs like OpenGL and Vulkan and everything just runs on top. Uh, VKD3D, that's the original project, 
uh, catches up on the direct X over Vulkan uh, front, but also we use it for shader compilers because Windows games have this habit of shipping shaders that are not compiled and you don't have to compile it for uh, for your hardware because there's this intermediate representation either called uh, direct X binary code or intermediate language, the DXIL. Uh, but instead of shipping that compiled form, they ship the full source code like written in the assembly, not assembly language, C-like language. And then you have to compile it. So we are having to rewrite all the D2D compilers and support the same edge cases, same quirks as they do. And this is one of the things we are doing. That's also purely PE side, so you can probably use it in the future on Windows. Uh, DXVK and VAPI. So this is where we kind of depart from pure Windows experience because uh, most of the things we are talking about until now ships in Windows. This doesn't ship in Windows, this ships with NVIDIA drivers. So whenever you install NVIDIA drivers, uh, there's a bunch of extra DLLs that are getting installed that are not part of DirectX 9 implementation or DirectX 11 implementation. Uh, and the nasty things about how they integrate with games is that uh, the games, when they see vendor, that the vendor of your graphics card is NVIDIA, they expect those DLLs to be there and there's no fallback. So if you don't have those DLLs, the game just crash, crashes. And because of that, we've been pretending on Linux for years that all NVIDIA GPUs are AMD RX 40, uh, 480. So if you've ever seen any statistics where uh, RX 480 is overrepresented, that's because of, <laughs> of, of this thing. Uh, so luckily now we have NVIDIA support and we have this community project that was started by Jens. Uh, awesome person from Netherlands, uh, just started writing a uh, re-implementation of the API uh, to be able to run things without having to do all that faking. Uh, and it works. NVIDIA noticed that, started contributing to it. They even ship DLLs with their Linux driver that are meant for the consumption of the games and of uh, DXVK and the API. So we've got support of, of the vendor for that effort. There is also the same thing, but from AMD. And uh, luckily, it's not as nasty API, but unluckily, uh, it ships with the games. So we cannot easily replace those DLLs because every game ships with a slightly different version of that, and they do crazy system level stuff. So we also don't want to implement that. So we just have one magical DLL for AMD AGS that implements all the versions and then does like querying on the whatever you have in your game directory, uh, probes the version of that. If it's one of the recognized ones, we like uh, expose exactly the same calls, but it's a little bit simpler and we don't need those third party extensions because uh, you don't have to ship proprietary parts of your driver like uh, DLSS support and whatnot. Uh, so while the shipping method for those DLLs is annoying, it's not as annoying or as disruptive as NVAPI was before the XVK NVAPI. Uh, let's see. And that's it. Now you have a good idea on how Wine slash Proton works. So uh, I'm working for Codeweavers. If you want to work on Wine and if you know some C and you want to do some system level programming in this crazy environment, please apply. And uh, thank you. I'll take any questions. And if some people want, I have still some leftover wine project stickers. You kind of answered the question a little bit when you were talking about the trigonometric functions and their approximations. But how do you know exactly what's the implementation between the syscalls in Windows and on Linux? Like, if you get a specific syscall, how do you know how it's implemented on Windows? Is it if it's just a guess? It's a reverse engineering, or how uh, does it work? Yeah, it's it's a guess. So basically, you can observe whatever the syscall does. So we don't uh, we know the names of the function, like NT something. Some of them are documented, some of them are not, most of them are not. Uh, there are like some third party sources that kind of explain that and that uh, still adheres to the clean room, uh, uh, clean room uh, implementation rule. But most of them are just like educated guesses and just figuring out what that does. Also, if you see something calling it, like game calling it directly, 
then we know what it's being called with, what parameters are being passed, and we can uh, use that to further our guess. So likely there's not a lot of things that do call those uh, syscalls directly. So we have a little bit of freedom and maybe some of them still don't behave the 100% as of Windows, but so far we haven't had to. But if you ever hit that wall and something does like NT set event with some flags that we haven't seen before, we'll know that we have a blind spot there and we should look how to improve that situation. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Do you have any sort of uh, automated testing in place to discover when there's new syscalls or maybe something being used differently? Uh, not really. It's just like a case-by-case -case basis. Usually that's for games, at least in the environment I'm working with. So I'm working on Proton. Uh, and... Uh, when game crashes, you just see what where, where, whether you see some fix missing the logs because we have like logging on that. So there are unit tests that we do for whatever stuff we've written, but there's no uh, window specification. Uh, there's a bunch of docs that are available on MSDN that we can use. Uh, there's, uh, but that, that's basically it. So we have to just wait for something to use it. People complain that it crashes and that's looking why it crashes and fixing that. that that's the usual workflow. Sort of further related to that, um, I feel like about 80% of the time I use Wine, it works perfectly. And then 20% of the time the program crashes and has zero explanation. Um, is there, are there any kind of like common offenders or monsters that keep coming back for like, if you have some random crash, where is that likely to be in Wine and in this compatibility layer? Uh, to be honest, most of the, Simple things are already solved. We have only the hard problems now. And most of that is uh, like programs being written in a bad way. And by a bad way, I mean they uh, depend on some very specific implementation behavior. Uh, quite often not uh, being like very aware of doing that. They just like were uh, punched into working uh, over time and they work on windows and that's the only implementation they uh, they work on so we basically at this point have to invest into bug compatibility this is things that we are doing all the time so recently we figured out that on wine point uh, 8.0 uh, the binding of isaac uh rebirth was crashing and this was uh dependent on the format of uh, things that are before allocated region. We, so we had to mimic the exact same thing uh, because otherwise it was would just crash. And it was working on previous versions of Proton just by accident. It's not like that we broke it, that we have changed something. It was just like a combination of different factors that made it work by accident. So I don't think there's like a huge missing part of API right now. Uh, we're implementing some things for uh, speech synthesis. We are uh, implementing things for speech recognition. But other than that, like it's just hard problems now. <laughs> the software is complicated and there's a lot of it. Yes. Uh, what's the current status or what are the plans for running 32-bit uh, and 64-bit x86 binaries on ARM64 Linux machines? Uh, so Upstream already has uh, integration with Box. Uh, 64, so that should work. I'm not sure about the 32 uh, bit stuff yet. And I know that there's plan to work on fax integrations as well. So this is being looked at by people that, by people that are a little smarter than me uh, and that actually know ARM and that, that that's not me. I'm like Proton uh, x86-64 and that, that's my world. But the, people are working on that. Uh, why don't you ask Microsoft about uh, interpolation parameters for these two functions? Uh, that, that's a good question. The question is, would we get an answer? I don't think so. Uh, and also, I'm not sure if that would be... Uh, like, I, I remember that this was brought by some people, but I'm not sure if that would be fully like a clean room. They would probably need to write like some legal thing. And like that that's something that I don't understand and I don't want to deal with. So the easier way is to just have something smart, uh, someone smart with math, uh, look at the output, look at the inputs, and like try to match the two. Hey, so uh, some of you may know me, some of you may not. I'm I work on Wine GE, Proton GE. Um, I didn't so much have a question as a I wanted to point out the importance of trying to get 
some of the uh, implement implementations that they have in wine working rather than using things like wine tricks. So like wine tricks is great, but it does exactly what you would expect. It goes and grabs the Windows version of those DLLs if they are publicly available for download. The problem is he, you know, he mentioned, for example, MSVCRT and uh, uh, UCRT base. A UCRT base in particular used to be shipped in VC Run 2015 and in, uh, also in early version of, of VC Run 2019. And they actually removed it from 2019. So there's a constant threat of those at some point not being available. Um, another thing is like uh, he mentioned Media Foundation. Media Foundation is only shipped in a Windows installation. There's no separate downloadable free version that you can get so that's another reason why it was a big big pain point and uh i think it's it's really important to stress that it's super helpful for anybody that is able to uh fix those things so that we can use the native version of ucrt base and get media foundation working rather than resorting to using a wine tricks as a workaround like yeah it will get your games to work most of the time but it's better off if you can try and code it and figure it out and get it corrected and upstream it So can you explain under like, what happens under the hood uh, when you switch between like uh, Windows versions? Like if you say set like Win 10, Win 7, Win 95, it, does it just report like a different version of Windows or does it do like actual things under the hood uh, in Wine? Uh, I think it just mostly switches the reported version as well. We had a bunch of hacks. Uh, I think there's still maybe some in place that uh, because Windows, uh, they care about backwards compatibility, but they not always get it right. So there's definitely like a little bit differences here and there. Uh, I haven't worked on that, but definitely like uh, replacing some registry keys. That's the important part because the game have detection of this. And when it comes to altering behavior, I would just need to grab the code because I don't know that. Is there any work that you do that is in line with what like React OS does with their open source implementation of, of Windows? Uh, to be honest, I don't know much about React OS. I don't think they follow the same clean room re-implementation guidelines as we do. So because of that, I have no interest. That was the same oh, really? yeah. Okay, we're out of time. Thanks.